I've been in love four times in my life. I'll tell a lie, three. I must confess I only thought I was in love with a one night experience called Denise when I was a teenager back in London. She showed a brief interest in my youthful manliness because she had just broken up with a bodybuilder named Gordon. It appears they always had sexual congress on the first and third Friday of the month because he reckoned any more would interfere with his rigorous training schedule. So with Gordon out of the picture, she was feeling an automatic and intense bi-weekly randiness. I was hanging about the youth club on what turned out to be a third Friday. Fate accomplice, as they say. It was a great night. I phoned her house afterwards every day for three weeks. Her mother always said she'd gone to visit her gran. Visit her gran? Every day for three weeks? I don't think so. I consoled myself that what I gained in wounded pride, I made up for in lost virginity. I saw Denise once, a few years later, in Peckham High Street. One kid holding her hand, one on a scooter, and one in a pram. She didn't look happy. I peered very close at the eldest one, but it was hard to see any real resemblance. It could be that he had my ears, but it was far from conclusive. My real first love was before Denise, a girl called Pamela at grammar school. Though that was pretty well platonic. Not from any want of trying by me, it just turned out that way. Pamela tended to avoid physical intimacy. I never even got her top button undone. I found out later she didn't want me fiddling around her chestal area because she used to shove her hockey socks down her brassier. Who told me that? The bloke she left me for. Typical, innit? Three years of I'm not that kind of girl and she falls into the back seat of a Ford Anglia with the very next one who comes along. Loses her hockey socks and her knickers in one fell swoop. Turns out she was that kind of girl, just not with me. After Pamela and Denise, there was a rather huge gap until my wife Joan. A very acceptable woman, not all that much to look at. We were a pair well met, as my mother used to say. Totally faithful was Joan, as far as I know. They say what a man really needs is a woman who is a lady in the kitchen and a whore in the bedroom. Joan was a lady in the kitchen and a lady in the bedroom also. Though I must admit that sexually I did only have that one Friday night with Denise to compare her to. But she was loving and kind and she had a smile that lit up the room. I walked into a lit up room every day of our marriage until she died. It was a disease and it was sudden and it was fatal and I'd rather not talk about it. The only bright spot was the funeral. I love the funeral. I was like the co-star. It was the first time I'd ever been so much the center of attention. I mean, in truth, Joan was the focal point, but I had the advantage over her of being alive. Such a pity it poured with rain all day. The forecast had said there would be sunny periods, but they did not eventuate. Still, I suppose the weather helped to create a suitably funereal atmosphere. What it also created was mud, which is why I fell ace over tip climbing into the limousine and skidded flat on my back into an open grave. 
It's thoroughly unpleasant down there, I might say. I've left it in my will to be cremated. I don't want to go through that again. I did a bit of damage to my lower spine and it's been giving me jip ever since. A large number of sessions with a physio named Zoe, a woman with liquid blue eyes and tiny but firm breasts, did little to improve it. The only good thing was that my dodgy spine got me offered early retirement. Took it like a shot. 50 plus years old and the rest of my life with nothing to do. Magic. I managed to fill up my days. I like my own company well enough and there's always TV. I used to like the soap operas but now it's more the chat shows. Fat Americans slugging it out on the screen beep, beep, beeping at each other and accusing their nearest and dearest of being whores. Whores in the kitchen, whores in the bedroom, sometimes even whores in the garage. Love it. I had a budgie for a while for company, but he also sadly passed away. The funeral was different from Jones, just me and Tweety and a shoebox. But it was good, small, but potent. My romantic life, however, has been less than active. Oh, I've had my share of passing fancies, but nothing to write home about. Not that I do write home, my mother being as passed away as Joan in the budgie, and my father having run off with another woman when I was 12, and is still living with her, the tart in Leamington Spa. Leamington Spa is a place in England. It's a nice place, but my father is not a nice man. He came to my wedding and got blind drunk and was caught groping a bridesmaid in the atrium. Mother nearly had a fit. Well, she did have a fit, actually. They had to call an ambulance just before we cut the cake. Added a piquant touch to the toast to absent friends. So when I fell in love again, just a few months ago, it was well overdue. Of course, there are many definitions of love. There is the love of a mother for a child, or a child for a mother, the love of a sibling for a sibling, the love of an uncle for a nephew, although we preferred to draw a veil over that one in our family. My love for Elizabeth, however, is the straight, romantic kind. Love, pure and simple, lightly intertwined with a soup spoon of lust. I first met Elizabeth, well, I first saw Elizabeth at the supermarket. Woolies, Sunday afternoon, April the 7th, 12 minutes past two. I know because I was glancing at my watch when I caught sight of her out of the corner of my eye. She was carrying more bags than a person of her stature ought to. Although women are amazingly strong when it comes to humping shopping bags, ask them to change a tire or shin up a drain pipe and they come over all weak and feeble. But for women, shopping is work and play all rolled into one. Cannot fathom it myself, but then I'm a man. Beast of burden, different mindset altogether, as indeed nature intended. Some men criticise women and their shortcomings as though they were somehow an inferior species. Not me. I love them. Women are soft and bumpy and cuddly and smell nice. I realise there are other good and practical things about them. I'm not sexist. But the soft and bumpy and sweet and smelly bits are quite enough for this satisfied customer. The reason I emigrated to Australia in the first place is because I had seen pictures of the beaches with shots of the sun-tanned, nubile female creatures in various relaxing and athletic poses. My sister Linda 
was here already. So I came on what used to be called the Family Reunion Scheme. She lives in Queensland. Doesn't speak to me anymore for some reason I cannot figure out. But I'm glad I came here. It has given me a hobby in the summer, roaming around Bondi Beach or Balmoral or even Cronulla. I make a day of it and take a cut lunch. I've got this really funny t-shirt that reads, I'm a pervert, what's your excuse? It makes the girls laugh. Not often, but it did once. If you set your camera pointing away from the beach, but put a mirror next to the lens, you can photograph girls without them knowing and without them staring at you in that snotty way. Just a little technical artifice I thought I would share. But these young women, even the topless ones, are just passing fancies. I knew right away Elizabeth was the real thing. We started stepping out together, a man and a woman about town. And I began to photograph her, of course. I mean, if you're gonna build up a comprehensive portfolio of somebody, then you need to start with a thorough pictorial representation. Her full name is Elizabeth Wood, a fact easily obtained by a swift glance at her letters in the post box of number two Lambert Street. A pretty house, two story, big enough for four people minimum, but she is the only person living there. At least I never saw anybody else come out or go in. So unless she was hiding a prisoner in the attic, she was a loner. I sometimes fantasize on the concept of being held a prisoner by Elizabeth in her attic. Tied hand and foot by silken twine, left alone to languish until such times as she chooses to visit me, to take advantage of my vulnerable position. It is a fantasy I have to restrict to once every couple of days because it tends to make me too excited and I get indigestion. No sign of boyfriends. Elizabeth is too busy, it seems to me. Works at the hairdressers every day, except Sunday and Monday, late night Thursday. Then she catches the bus home, all alone, to face a sad and lonely, empty house. Has she never been married? Did her husband leave her? What? I found a marriage certificate in her desk in the upstairs room. So that answered part of the question. I blame her for leaving the back window open when she has a sun deck. So careless, a burglar could have got in there. Somebody who meant her harm. And her leaving a front door key hanging in a totally obvious place in the hall, criminal. Lucky for me, the locksmith wasn't busy. I got a copy and got the key back in time. Then the pieces of the jigsaw all fell together. I found her husband's death certificate. A tragedy in such a young man. Same condition as Joan. Never mind, no sense in getting morbid. So I continued my investigation. You see, when you're in love with a person, it stands to reason you've got to get to know them at a deeper level than a person with whom you have a superficial relationship. But I draw the line at actually getting into her bed. Real intimacy demands the consent of the other party. Getting between these covers is something for which permission has not yet been granted. Queen size, plenty of room. I'll wager there was many a blissful night here between Elizabeth and Stephen, her late husband. Makes it a bit sacred, really. 
So sitting on is one thing. Climbing in is quite different. A no-go area. Stay out, not allowed. For a while, it became a regular pattern of life for me. Round the house at maybe half ten, a cappuccino in a plastic cup from the cafe down the road, phone to make sure she was at the shop, pretend it was a wrong number, or just ring off. Sit on the bed or the sofa for 10 minutes, sometimes 15. There's no point in being rigid about these things. Then rummage around for another 10, see what I could learn. This is more than an exploration. This is a quest. Out by 11.15 sharp, mission accomplished. Men is the time I've thought of leaving an anonymous note or taking an item. Knickers would be favourite, but I draw the line at outright theft. One reason is biblical, the fourth commandment, thou shalt not steal, or is it the fifth? The other reason is evidence. A pair of knickers discovered in my possession is evidence. Stand up in court, that would. And there's no point in bringing the law enforcement agencies into my relationships. Sadly, the boyfriend situation got resolved soon after. Elizabeth is a religious person, goes to church most Sundays, and I like to go with her. I wait outside, of course, being I'm an atheist. Have been ever since that unfortunate experience with a nun who was less than charitable, if you ask me. Normally, Elizabeth went straight home, but this week she was hanging about talking to some bloke. Marginally better looking than me, I'll grant you, but otherwise, no challenge. So I was hardly jealous at all, bastard. I wanted to call out, you are outside a house of the Lord, my friend, not in some spiritual pickup joint, but I didn't. He didn't look bright enough to appreciate the irony. He took her for coffee afterwards at a little coffee shop nearby. Chat, 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 smam, smam, smam. Then he ran her home the cheek of it. I would have grabbed a taxi and shouted, follow that car, but it seemed to me an unjustifiable extravagance for the pleasure of reenacting a rather tired cliché. Not that it mattered. By the time I got there on foot, they were still sitting outside, talking about what I do not know. But I'll bet it wasn't about Jesus, when eventually he drove off. She had that look. The look of someone who has just been kissed. He must have asked if he could see her again because next Sunday his car was back. And the Sunday after that. It was getting to be a rather unfortunate habit. When they got back the second time, she asked him in for coffee. Coffee? I don't think so. Then one morning, I happened to be round that way, taking a 7am constitutional. I saw a certain party being where he shouldn't, when he shouldn't. And her husband in his grave, not three years since. Well, I think you will agree Something had to be done about it, right? Right. And I was the someone to do that something. I had followed him home several times, naturally, so I knew where he lived. He was married, of course. Nice little house. Nice little wife. Nice little setup all round. I didn't notice any kiddies, which was a blessing, considering what he was doing. 
and what he was doing was toying with the affections of Elizabeth. A capital crime in my book. I mean, would he tell her he was married? No, sir. It will be the wedding ring slipped off the finger and into the wallet straight after he left work. He would be saying, cross my heart, I'm unmarried and available as he checked on her hockey sock situation. However, my job was merely to bring him to justice, not be judge and jury and executioner. More's the pity, but I could do my own little bit. It was my duty to Elizabeth, after all. I left a cryptic note for the wife in the letterbox. She worked part-time at the health food shop, so she always got home first. Capital letters, of course, cunningly disguised handwriting, written with a pen I stole from the bank and threw in someone else's wheelie bin straight after. It read, away on a business trip last weekend, innocent? I do not think so. My advice is that you check on his story. Ask him about a certain data processing operative at his office. Signed, a well-wisher. His visits to Elizabeth's place stopped straight away. Soon after, on her way home from the shop, I could see that she was crying. Had he told her it was all over? How I longed to take her in my arms and hold her close to me and say, never mind, time is a great healer. And she would rest her head on my chest and sob as though her heart was breaking. But a healthy, healing sort of sobbing, leading to the realization that true love is only a hop and a skip and a flannelette shirt away. Unhappily, it was a head-on chest fantasy that did not happen at that juncture or any other juncture come to that. Sometimes, late in the evening, I like to think of Elizabeth in her pyjamas, the blue ones with the white spots. Those are my favourites. In her reverie, she is pondering the man of her dreams, an honest man, a widowed man, whom she has yet to meet, well, meet properly, and who, coincidentally, looks rather like me. But now the picture has changed, changed to the satisfying scene of a married man battling out with a suspicious wife, at pains to figure out why she thinks he is being unfaithful with a data processing operative, but still unable to explain why he was not on a so-called overnight business trip. Hell hath no fury like a woman spurned, as I was soon to find out, because she threw him out, lock, stock and vulgar red suitcase, the last of which I caught him unloading at 3.15 on a Saturday afternoon. He was getting his feet under the table, getting his posterior under the doona, moving in with bells on, where did this leave me? It left me with nothing but my memories of Elizabeth, now permanently invaded and besmirched by this intruder. Needless to say, my daily visits to the house have tailed off somewhat. A visit to her bathroom cabinet is not the same when a Gillette razor lays next to a nail polish remover. I can hardly bring myself to go into the bedroom there is a male atmosphere in there, and not a very pleasant one at that. I have to admit that this man cannot be all bad. If Elizabeth loves him, he must have something good about him. But that doesn't stop me from hating him, from his pale blue wife fronts to the very essence of his being. I wonder if Alison feels the same way. That's his wife's name, Alison. An attractive woman. As I said, she works part-time at the health food shop, so I get plenty of chances 
to pop in and look around. I don't want you to think I'm fickle, but a man has got to take his chance where he can. According to the correspondence from the lawyers, the divorce will be through soon. It should be clear cut, without children to clutter it up, which means Alison will soon be free to spread her wings, so to speak. And I'll be there when she needs me, that's for sure. So I was right before. It makes four times I've been in love.